unabashed advertisement for classical music. At this point, I expect most of you are tempted to doze off, especially after such an exciting talk from Natalie. Uh, but do try to stay awake, even if it means putting toothpicks in your eyes to stay awake. <laughs> so, put up your hand if you learn an instrument, I presume. <laughs> Whoa, that's surprisingly little, but um... <laughs> <laughs> if you do, that means uh, your primary source of exposure would be through um, everyone's favorite ABRSM or training <laughs> exams. Everyone loves getting that distinction. Understandably, a dislike or even intense hater is well nigh inevitable from um, these stressful or even controlling conditions, where the, to the sole goal of um, taking exams is technical perfection at all costs. And then there's the Mozart effect. Um, <laughs> In a study in 1993, psychologists measured a temporary 15-minute increase in IQ after listening to Mozart uh, Sonata for two pianos. Yet by the time this study had reached the general public, it had been distorted into the Mozart effect, where listening to classical music had an indefinitely, um, indefinite effect of both boosting your IQ to some magical level where you suddenly turned into a genius after listening to three minutes of Mozart. So, um, now, consequent studies pretty much have either disproved or found l little evidence for this um, effect, and I'm tempted to just believe that it's some sort of hoax. In the same way that um, your parents argue that rock music will make you stupider because they just don't want it here in their house. So, um, other than to boost sales of CDs of Mozart for babies, like these, I don't think this is a very useful argument. Finally, you probably think the average listener of classical music looks like this. <laughs> or maybe even just dead. Um, indeed, why should I even bother to um, persuade you to listen to a bygone art form that's considered obsolete? Why should I even try to persuade you? So, I have three reasons for this. The firstly, firstly, there are so many emotions to be explored within classical music. No, not all of that is that relaxing and nondescript music that you find on your 100 best piece of classical music CD that you find lying around your house dusty and forgotten. So even I have a tendency to fall asleep to that. From the religious solemnity of 12th century composer Hildegard von Bingen's music, to the playfulness of Mozart's myriad piano concertos symphonies, to the heroic struggles of Beethoven's nine symphonies, and to the harsh academic dissonance of the second Viennese school, there's probably something you'll find that fits your mood. So, the intense and fluctuating emotions one experiences as a teenager can seem painfully far removed from the seemingly static pieces that you've heard. But you really just need to find the right pieces to match your mood, I think. Need a breakup song? Try the walling despair of Goodnight, the first lead or song of uh, Franz Schubert's Winterreis, where a traveler laments his farewell to his lover as he walks through a frigid winter wasteland. So, it starts with a line, As a stranger I arrived, and as a stranger I leave. <laughs> five minutes long, so it fits in the general confines of a pop song. And yes, it's in German, but don't tell me you don't already search up the lyrics for a pop song anyways. <laughs> so, um, the next composer I'll be talking about is Gustav Mahler, the central figure in this painting, uh, who wrote nine brilliant symphonies that I enjoy very much and often end up listening to. Despite their length, which often exceeds an hour, fitting pretty much the stereotype that Classical music is long, boring, and make, will make you fall asleep. It takes some extremely abrupt changes in mood, swinging between the sublime and the grotesque in the shortest of times. He takes you on a true roller coaster of emotions, from one peak to another, to the, the deepest, deepest pit, and all the way back up again. Take his symphony number two, subtitled The Resurrection, which happens to be one of the most epic titles of any music ever, which begins with a funeral <laughs> march for the title, uh, a hero in the story.
So after around one hour of music, you eventually reach this um, gorgeous finale announcing the resurrection of a hero after his death. And warning, this is going to be loud because pretty much the whole orchestra, choir, and organ are playing here. <coughs> Pieces on the opposite can seem almost emo at times, so to speak. His song symphony Das Lied von der Erde begins with this out, which begins with this outburst. piece contains a line that's almost edgy in a way and could fit in almost <laughs> any pop song these days which is dark as like <laughs> So yeah, there will pretty much always be something there for you so um, even if something doesn't explicitly fit your uh, what you have in mind that you want to hear in that mood, there might be something that'll fit uh, your something that'll give you that catharsis that you need. The academic rigor of the Viennese, a second Viennese school, which utilizes what is known as twelve tone technique, in which the theme of a piece uses all twelve tones of the chromatic scale, meaning all keys, both black and white, on the piano, may seem almost emotionally sanitized. However, the dissonance and clashing sounds that result from these pieces often can give you an output for those negative or anxious feelings that you may have. Another one of my favorite composers, Anton Bruckner, wrote pretty rousing symphony uh, symphonies in which there are huge brass ensembles in. Um, which may have possessed a more religious connotation in the devout com uh, Catholic composer's mind. However, I just like listening to it for the hell of it, and just, if, just as an ego booster, really. <laughs> so next, I'd like to move on to the concept of delayed gratification, and yes, it is that video of kids eating marshmallows. <laughs> uh, most music these days lasts between two to five minutes, offering a a continued stretch of virtually unvaried tempo and rhythm and an ever so predictable chorus verse structure that's pretty much the musical equivalent of a sugar rush. And it, emotional fulfillment is experienced in one concentrated dose, comes quickly and goes quickly. In classical music, you really have to wait for that fulfillment. The length is often seen as a detractor, but I'd like to reshape it and offer a different perspective where this is something that can help you. Carrying on from Bruckner, who actually looks like this, and was a pretty weird person overall, his, um, his symphonies are like Mahler's, extremely long, and take some, a great deal of patience to get used to. For example, in his symphony number no. 8, you're immediately hit by this immense wave of sound from the brass. it just fades out into a more quiet section and it takes almost 10 minutes for this theme to return after a long period of pretty much silence which I've sped up for your 
benefit so I'll sit here for 10 minutes. <laughs> In fact, this is one of my favorite things about classical music, um, waiting for that striking moment to reappear in music so that um, it gives the greater sense of tension and anticipation, which in effect produces delayed gratification. As many studies have shown, unlike the Mozart effect, which, yeah, as I mentioned, is a hoax pretty much, it, being able to uh, display the qualities of delayed gratification tend to correlate with success in life. Not everybody is born with this quality, of course, and it can be ir get irritating to wait for something, but this patience can be developed. Of course, I really don't recommend you go, up, go off and listen to a six-hour opera on your first try of classical music, <laughs> but um, instead of quitting the pe uh, piece of classical music at the first moment of like silence or quiet, a quiet section, I would recommend you try to listen and wait for that, the return of the next exciting section, which caught your ear in the first place. Slowly, being able to wait for that moment and to <coughs> gather that excitement may translate into a more mature sense of delayed gratification. Finally, we have historical context. All art is inevitably based um, around the society and culture around it. This makes classical music a great way of understanding the social changes throughout history. As someone interested in history, I'm fascinated by the way how music and history intersect <coughs> throughout the pieces that I've heard. My favorite example of this would be Dmitry Shostakovich, who is on the left here. Um, so listen to this extract from his eight string quartet. <coughs> that it could pretty much pass for a metal headbanger. Um, doesn't it sound quite erratic and slightly mad? <coughs> Shostakovich had more than enough reason to be. If you're wondering why Stalin is portrayed on the right here, this is because um, Shostakovich was a Russian composer who was born in 1906 and lived under some of the most repressive eras of just Stalin's Soviet Union. Though he was an initially popular composer among, among uh, the circles in, artistic circles in the USSR, um, Stalin attended and was disgusted by one of um, Shostakovich's operas, and before long, a denouncement of the composer appeared in the newspapers. This left with him uh, with the fear of being taken away to Siberian gulags or shot by the secret police, as many of his best friends had been, disappearing one day and never coming back. He was spared and continued to compose for the rest of his life, but he never lost his fear of persecution. One can always read about the hard facts from a history book, but the effect on the people is far more oblique and hidden behind the veil of time. Much of Shostakovich's music reflects his experience as under the dictator of Stalin, as well as his experiences during World War II, in which he, uh, he was in Leningrad, which was one of the um, battlegrounds of World War II. So what better way to understand the psychological impact of war, torture, and Stalin's brutal regime in Soviet Russia than to listen to someone who was actually there? Of course, he was not the only case. Beethoven wrote his Third Symphony, partly in response to what he saw as Napoleon's embodiment of humanistic ideals, who he saw as an improvement to the monarchs of um, Europe during that time. However, he then rejected the symphony's dedication to the Frenchman when Napoleon decided to declare himself emperor, leading Beethoven to believe him no better than those who had preceded him. The, reaction of, uh, the reactions towards the impact of the Industrial Revolution can found, be found easily in the Romantic era in its embrace of nature. While the trauma of the world wars and destruction wrought upon Europe 
like here, can be detected in the harshly serialistic works of post the post-war Darmstadt school. Here, the emotional expression of the Romantic era is conspicuously uh, rejected in exchange for a mathematical construction of total serialism, where everything is set, even <coughs> pitch, rhythm, and uh, dynamics are, uh, are predetermined in a sex structure. History can almost be experienced in more, mu a lo a quite an alive manner through the pieces of classical music, something that is difficult to replicate even in other part pieces of art, um, something that is, makes it a truly precious resource. To summarize, I think you should listen to classical music for three reasons. The emotional variety that you can find within many works of classical music, the benefits of developing a greater sense of delayed gratification, and finally the historical connotations within every piece of music that can lead you to understand it further. I understand that many of you have probably experienced classical music in a negative condition, probably falling asleep, um, but however, I hope that you can rethink your perspective and give this truly marvelous world of sound another chance. Finally, allow me to end on a quote from um, Gosa, the famous German player who once said, where the words end, let the music begin. Please go explore the world of classical music. Its beauties are beyond my meager words. Thank you.